and we can get started. Uh, so I have a couple of remarks on the previous uh, classes uh, lecture. So the first remark is that remember I was uh, stuck whether this is considered linear convergence or not. And I couldn't find a conclusive book or, or um, conclusive uh, document which says what is it that converges linearly when you are looking at fxk minus fx star. Uh, so some books, some papers or books or lecture notes will say q over k is a linear convergence case. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, some, so for instance, Bertseker says that fxk minus fx star less than equal to q beta raised to k is a linear convergence or exponential convergence. So I just am at a loss in defining it properly because every book or lecture notes I, I, I see, the definitions are slightly different from each other. Uh, the other comment I had was, uh, it was pointed out to, to me by Shujin that I had this equation wrong. So this is beta raised to p raised to k. No. Beta raised to p raised to k. So this is p raised to k in the exponent and this is beta raised to p raised to k. So please make that correction to yesterday's class. Okay. So this is q multiplied by beta multiple raised to p raised to k. Okay, so with this correction, uh, let me start today's lecture. And in today's class, my goal is to talk about two algorithms. One is Gauss-Newton's method. So we have talked about gradient descent and we have studied some sort of convergence uh, 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 properties of gradient descent algorithms. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about some classes of gradient descent algorithms. So the first class is Gauss-Newton method. And the second is uh, conjugate direction method. Okay. So let's talk about Gauss-Newton's method. I want to minimize X in Rn, so it's an unconstrained minimization problem. One over two summation of GI X square, I equals one to N. And GI is a differentiable function from Rn to R. Okay. And I'm going to define G of X as G1 can X2. I can't see anything. Sorry, can there was can a problem? Zoom out the screen. The screen is only showing one equation. Can you speak so, a little louder? Can you zoom out the screen? Zoom out the screen. Uh, can you like yeah? It's I can only see one equation. I can't see okay. the whole page. Is that a problem for others as well? No. 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 Okay. Uh, have you zoomed your own zoom? Oh, wow. That's a funny statement. Let me see. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think the screen is pretty visible and I'm writing pretty in, in large font. So you shouldn't have any issues. Do you want to re rejoin the Zoom meeting again? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me, uh, you know, just write down the expression for gradient of g of x, the gradient is actually given by, no, 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 sorry. Uh, so f of x, which is the problem, is actually norm of 
g of x square. This is the two norm. So I'm going to omit the two here uh, because we'll most likely be working with two norms in the entire class. So the problem is to minimize fx, x in Rn. So if you want to do this minimization, uh, let's just apply the vanilla gradient descent method. And in order to apply the gradient descent method, I need to compute gradient g of x, now gradient f of x. Now, of course, uh, I, I know that this was a quiz problem and that was due last week. So all of you must have attempted this before. I, I know that 47 people have attempted quiz, quiz two over the weekend, by the weekend. So I, I'm pretty sure most of you have seen this derivative before. So I'm just going to write it down. So gradient of fx is equal to gradient of one over two summation of gi of x i equals one to n no i'm using small no i should use capital n here i should use capital n square and this is equal to summation i equals one to capital n gix gradient of gix and if you want to write it in vector form it would be gradient of gx into gx so this is a vector in r n cross capital n this is a vector in r capital n Any questions so far? Uh, you said the second part was the vector form, right? Yes, this is the vector form. Uh, so this is the summation form and this is like the matrix multiplied by a vector form. So we want to minimize this function fx, which appears as the, the two norm of gx square, where gx is defined in this way. And if you want to apply the gradient descent method, I just need to um, compute the gradient of fx and I then can apply the usual steepest descent algorithm. Now I want to do something better than steepest descent and I know that Newton's method is strictly better than steepest descent method. So in order to apply Newton's method, I need to now compute the second derivative of the function f. So let's see what that second derivative is. So I'm just going to use this and I'm going to differentiate it with respect to X. So I have the following second derivative, gradient of GIX, gradient of GIX transpose plus GIX, second derivative of GIX, okay? So this is my second derivative. This term can be written as gradient of gx, gradient of gx transpose. Okay, so what would Newton's method be? If I want to run a Newton's method, I need to run xk plus one equals to xk 
minus alpha k second derivative at x k inverse first derivative of f x k. This is my Newton's method, right? Um, so what all things do I need to compute for Newton's method? So I need to compute the first derivative of the function f. And if you look at it, the first derivative of function would involve computing the gradient of gx and then gx. Okay, these are the two terms needed to compute for computing the first derivative of the function f. What about the second derivative of function? Okay, so in order to compute the second derivative of function, I need to compute the gradient of gx and gradient of gx transpose. Okay, this term, but what you notice is actually this term can easily be computed once you have this term. So once I know the gradient of g of x, I can also compute gradient of g of x, gradient of g of x transpose because it's a simple matrix multiplication. Now I also need to compute the second derivative. So this term is also computed. This term is computed because I need it to be needed for the computation of the first derivative. But this is an additional term that needs to be computed. All right, so now um, the stage is set for introducing Gauss-Newton's method. You, what would you do if I ask you that I want it to be close to Newton's method, not exactly Newton's method, and I want to reduce the computational burden, what would you do if I give you the task of reducing the computational burden for Newton's method? Any thoughts? Uh, avoid computing the inverse of the uh, second derivative. Okay, so avoid computing the inverse of the second derivative. Uh, so unfortunately, we want it to be close to Newton's method, so we have to compute matrix inverse. Uh, do we? Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, so you can go ahead. No, I was just going to say that we create an approximation. Approximation of, so yes, I want an approximation of the second derivative of the function f. What could be a good approximation of the second derivative of function without incurring an additional computational overload? Um, saying that you can ignore the second term in the second order derivative of x. Perfect, so you want to ignore this term. Yeah. So this term is an additional term that needs to be computed purely for computing the second derivative. But if I ignore this term, then the first term is actually easily computed because I know the first derivative of the function. Okay, so that's Gauss-Newton's method. You, you, you just got born like 200 years later. If you were born like 200 years earlier, this would be your name. Okay. So the idea in Gauss-Newton's method is as follows. Um, I'm going to ignore this term, okay? And what I get is xk plus one equals to xk minus alpha k gxk gxk transpose inverse gxk gxk okay so this is the approximation inverse and this is of course exactly equal to gradient of the function at xk
Okay, any questions so far? Um, professor? Yes. Uh, is this approximation, I mean, is the only motive for the approximation uh, reducing the computational complexity or uh, is it known that the term that we are deleting there is small for some reason? Uh, so this term need not be small unless your GI of X is linear or almost linear. Okay. So, so we may be losing quite a bit of uh, information there. That's right. You're losing quite a bit of information, but what you do know is assuming that this is positive definite, so gradient of GXK, gradient of GXK transpose, assuming this is positive definite, uh, mm -hmm. this is a valid gradient descent method because your DK is positive definite. Okay. And okay. it also is incorporating some sort of curvature information. So it's not com incorporating the entire curvature, but some information about the curvature is embedded within this particular term. And remember, right. when you're computing the second derivative, you only need this term to be negligible in comparison to this term, you know, so right. it may not be equal to zero, it could be something more than zero or different from zero, as long as this is incomparable, like it's, it's very small, in comparison to this term, you are in good shape. Okay. Right. And that's okay. the underlying idea behind Gauss Newton's method, which is um, you don't have to compute the second derivative of GI and that saves some amount of computational burden. And assuming okay. that this is small in comparison to the first term, you are in good shape. And, hmm. uh, and that's why this method is sort of popular. If you want to do some sort of least square minimization, this is known as a least square problem. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Is this exclusive for least squares problems or does it generalize to other problems as well? This is exclusively for least square because this second derivative term, I mean, this sort of uh, second derivative decomposition will only happen for least square problem. It won't happen for, you know, some, some other problem. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and least square, by the way, just so you know, least square problems are very, very common in statistics and in control systems and system identification and machine learning type problems. So, which is why this, this method is famous or, or useful. You get the speed up of Newton's method without actually computing the second derivative term. All right, now what happens when this uh, matrix matrix transpose is not uh, positive definite, then you can do the following. You can, instead of taking the gradient, gradient G transpose inverse, you can take gradient G XK, gradient G XK transpose plus beta K identity inverse. So beta k is some, some positive number. And identity is of course the usual identity matrix. That will make this whole term positive definite. This will be positive definite. And uh, you can then run the Gauss-Newton's method with this additional term beta k i. Okay. Uh, you said uh, red is for if it's not positive definite, right? Yes, only if this okay. term gradient G, gradient G transpose is not positive definite. So it's positive semi-definite for sure, but it may not be positive definite, in which case you want to just add a small identity matrix, small multiple of identity matrix to make it positive definite and then take the inverse. Okay, so that's uh, Gauss-Newton's method, a uh, pretty straightforward derivation. And this is one of the approximate Newton's method. 
so professor the value for bk would you have to find the smallest value that would make this dk uh, positive definite is that the no question? so any beta k strictly greater than 0 will make this matrix positive definite okay yeah Now, you could argue, how do you pick B K, beta k? And all I'm going to say is use your experience. So use different values of beta k's in the beginning. And as you um, get more experienced on solving the problem, you will kind of know what an optimal value of beta k should be. OK. So no further question, let's move on to the second method, which is conjugate direction method. All right, so in conjugate direction method, my goal is to solve the following minimization problem. So Q is positive definite, B is a vector in Rn. So this is my function F of X. Now, is this function Fx convex? Remember, Q is positive definite. So let's look at the first derivative of the function fx. It's Qx minus P. The second derivative of the function, it's just Q. Q is positive definite, and therefore, f is positive definite for all x in Rn. f is convex. So we are basically trying to solve a convex minimization problem. How would I compute the optimal solution? What do you think? Find the first derivative and set it to zero. Perfect. So the first derivative is given here. Let's set it to zero. Q x star minus B equals to zero, which means my X star is equal to Q inverse B. So actually, if I know the matrix Q and I know the vector B, I can literally take a matrix inverse and do the multiplication and I can compute the optimal solution. Okay. Let's assume that my n is very large. My n is 1,000 or, or 10,000 or something like that. So Q inverse is complicated. n equals to 1,000 implies Q inverse is complicated. Well, complicated to compute. So I want to avoid computing Q inverse. And I want to come up with a gradient descent scheme to be able to do that. And that's what conjugate direction method attempts to address. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. So what's the idea and key idea in conjugate direction method. Let D1 to Dn in Rn be Q conjugate vectors. If you recall, you did this in uh, assignment one. So what does it mean for some 
set of vectors to be Q conjugate, it means that di transpose Q dj is equal to zero for all i not equal to j. And I want to run the following gradient descent algorithm. Well, it's not gradient descent yet, but we will make it a gradient descent algorithm in a bit. So xk plus one equals to xk plus alpha k dk. X naught is some vector in Rn. Uh, let me make it x1 because I'm using d1 here. So I'm starting from x1 in Rn. I'm going to compute alpha k according to the minimization rule. But remember this alpha is in R, okay? So not in Rn, but it's uh, not in R greater than zero, but it's in R of f of xk plus alpha dk. Okay, how do we compute this argument? Let's first compute this argument. Assume that we are given this set of Q conjugate vectors which satisfies this property, Q, di transpose Q dj equals to zero. And let's say I want to run this particular scheme with alpha k as argument of this function f, uh, xk plus alpha dk. How do I compute this argument? Uh, well, we can again take the first derivative of f. So remember, the function f is convex in x. So the function f is also convex in alpha. And therefore, we can um, just take the first derivative with respect to alpha, set it equal to zero, and we can get the optimal value of alpha k. So let's do the computation. So this is derivative with respect to alpha. So let me just write it as d over d alpha Okay, this is how I can find at alpha equals to alpha k. Let me substitute the function f in here. So I have d over d alpha x half xk plus alpha dk transpose q xk plus alpha dk minus b transpose xk plus alpha dk equal to zero. Well, let me not take this equal to zero yet. I'll do it in the end. Looks like a horrible expression. I mean, it is a horrible expression, but let's compute it. Half alpha square dk transpose q dk plus Um, xk alpha xk transpose q dk plus half xk transpose q xk minus alpha b transpose dk minus b transpose xk. Okay, I just want to make sure that I haven't made any mistake in this computation. So you should also check and let me know if you find any error.
okay it seems to me that everything is correct no errors here what should the derivative be with respect to alpha i need your help Okay. No one wants to. Um, is it yeah. alpha dk transpose u dk? Yes. Plus xk transpose u dk. Yeah. Uh, minus b transpose dk. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. So we have alpha dk transpose q dk plus dk qxk minus b dk transpose qxk minus b okay now at alpha equals to alpha k this needs to be equal to zero so i get alpha k so remember d over d alpha fx k plus alpha dk evaluated at alpha k must be equal to zero this implies alpha k must be equal to dk transpose b minus q x k over dk transpose q dk Okay, so if we knew dk, I can actually compute alpha k purely through some matrix manipulation. And uh, I mean matrix compute in the matrix multiplication. And uh, I can just substitute this value of alpha k in xk plus alpha k dk. and I can compute the optimal solution to the optimization problem um, as K increases. Now the problem here is that someone needs to tell me the Q conjugate vectors D1 to Dn upfront at the very beginning of time before I before I run this algorithm. So that's the drawback of this method at this point of time. Uh, how can we alleviate this drawback? So suppose I don't have D1 to Dn or Dk, uh, yeah, D1 to Dn. Uh, how can we, or are there any thoughts or are there any, or do you have any ways of computing Dk on the fly? How would we do it? Let me give you some hint in order to think about a simplification. So remember, we are computing B minus QXK in the process of computing alpha K. And if you think about it, this term is actually negative gradient of FXK. The gradient of FXK is QX, uh, gradient of F is QX minus B. So this is negative of gradient of fxk. So in order to compute alpha k, I have to compute the negative of gradient of fx. Any thoughts? Would any orthogonal vectors work? So 
any orthogonal well the orthogonal vectors will not work because as you have seen in assignment 1 uh, there are some coefficients that you need to compute in order to make those orthogonal vectors q orthogonal vectors so orthogonal vectors are identity orthogonal vectors but here we require q orthogonal vectors i mean q conjugate vectors it's called q conjugate not q orthogonal okay so here is the idea here is the next idea since i have to compute the negative gradient anyways i am going to compute dk on the fly using information about negative gradient fx1 negative gradient fx2 all the way to negative gradient fxk okay so that's the idea now how do we do it well you have already done it in your assignment so i'm just going to give you the simplified expression Uh, which follows the same line of reasoning as was there in your assignment with some additional complications and this idea is already there in the book and i have um uh so you can always go back and read the book in in case you want to understand the derivation of this expression that i'm going to write um now so i'm going to pick d1 to be minus gradient of fx1 i can pick d1 uh according to any uh i i can pick d1 as any vector so i'm just going to pick it as negative gradient of fx1 so that's b minus qx1 and as i have mentioned the negative gradient is already it you already need to compute it in order to compute alpha k so so it's good i'm not doing anything new here and then the claim is if you define dk to be equal to negative gradient fxk let me well let me define ck to be negative gradient fxk and i want to define dk to be ck plus beta k dk minus 1 where beta k is equal to ck transpose dk over okay so at time k i compute the negative gradient of fxk and i'm going to call it ck then i compute beta k using this uh, simple matrix multiplication or vector multiplication and then i'm going to substitute this beta k here multiplied by dk minus 1 and i'm going to add ck to it in order to get the value of dk and it so turns out that dk is q conjugate vectors professor uh, i have a yes. question uh, in the assignment uh, we took uh, c1 c2 and uh, turned c right. as linearly independent right uh, will it we be here the case here as well yes like, yes so either so it won't be linearly independent only if you are already at the optimal solution so let's say you picked your x1 in such a manner that x2 is the optimal solution then b minus q x2 will be equal to 0 in which case you will be at the optimal solution so you just have to terminate your optimization algorithm but assuming that you are not at the optimal solution which means b minus q x k is not equal to 0 or c k is not equal to 0 then it is guaranteed to be linearly independent of um c1 all the way up to c k minus 
And the reason why it would be linearly independent is given in the book, but uh, uh, in, in, in crux, the... So, so let, me, let me get to it, why it would be linearly, or some intuition about why it would be linearly independent uh, in a bit, okay? So I, I'll take any other questions you may have, except for the linear independence part, which is actually a very good question. Any other question on this expression? Um, for I have a question, um, just something you wrote below key ideas up above, if you can scroll up. I was just wondering what was the word you wrote right below? Oh, this, this key idea or the key idea above it? Above, above the red one. Okay. Right. Yeah. So let D1 to Dn be Q conjugate vectors. I'm going vectors, to run okay. the iteration Xk plus one equals to Xk plus alpha K DK where alpha K is given by this minimization rule. All right, thank you. That's the key idea. Now, the second idea is I need to compute DK on the fly using the information that has already been computed. And it just so turns out that they will be linearly independent unless you have already hit the optimal solution. And uh, this is the simplified expression after doing some tedious computation, you get at the simplified expression for computing DK from the past information. Uh, professor, yes. so this particular algorithm runs for at most n steps? That's right. Or can it run? That was my next okay. next uh, claim. Okay, okay. Okay, so the, the next claim was that this method runs for at most n steps. So after n steps, you are guaranteed to converge. Uh, but of course, you can stop before n steps <clears throat> if your set criteria is met. So for instance, if your norm of gradient of fxk is less than equal to 10 raised to minus 2, you can say that, okay, I'm close to the optimal solution. I'll just stop here. Right? So you can potentially... Uh, get away with approximately optimal solution in fewer than n iterations. So if this is your criteria, you can get away in fewer than n iterations. Okay. All right. So, any other question? So let me go back to the question that was asked a little bit earlier, which is, are we guaranteed that CK is going to be a linearly independent set of vectors? So let's first try and understand what exactly is this optimization algorithm trying to do, okay? So I want to draw a picture. So this is my X star. These are my fx equal to one, fx equal to two lines. And let's say I'm starting here. This is my x1. And when I'm sitting at x1, I look at the gradient of fx1. And I do the line minimization So I pick my D1 equals to gradient of Fx1. I pick alpha1 equals to argument Fx1 plus alpha D1. Okay, so I can either go in this direction or I can go in this direction because alpha1 can, be, can take any positive or negative value. Okay, so the positive value will be in this direction, the negative value will be in this direction, and once you do the computation, 
you will actually realize that, let me draw another line. Uh, the value of alpha one will be such that this would be your X2. This would be your X2. Okay, after you compute X2 equal to X1 plus alpha one D1. And from X2, you will apply another round of this conjugate gradient method using the DK computed using the previous claim, and then you will converge. So this is a two dimensional system. So you will actually converge in two steps to the optimal solution. Okay, so this is one way to view this conjugate gradient method. So every time, um, so think about it this way. So this is your first derivative gradient of fx1. What would the second derivative be? The second derivative will be this. This is your gradient of fx2. And uh, now can you convince yourself that gradient of fx1 and gradient of fx2 are actually linearly independent of each other? Does that seem plausible in this picture? Yes, it yeah. does. Right, so that's why it will be linearly independent. So you can, so this is two dimensional system, but in three dimensional, four dimensional or higher dimensional situations, this is also going to be true. Okay, so that's one way to uh, visualize this particular algorithm. So every time you are um, going to generate a gradient, which is going to be linearly independent of all the past gradients, and then you can compute the Q conjugate vector and move in that direction, unless you hit X star at the very beginning itself. So when can that happen? Let me just draw a picture. This is my X star. And let's say I, by some stroke of luck, I picked my X1 like this. This is my gradient of FX1. This is my negative gradient of FX1. And by picking an appropriate value of alpha one, you will actually hit X star in the first step itself. So alpha one D1 in this case. in which case you will converge in fewer than n steps uh, to the optimal solution. But of course, this is a very special case. So typically you will be in this situation where you have picked some arbitrary initial point and therefore you will have to run all the way to n iterations in order to get to the optimal solution. But you could potentially stop earlier if you feel that you are at an approximately optimal solution. And that's the beauty of this method. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, Professor. Thank okay. you. Great. So this is, uh, these are the two methods. Uh, the first method was Gauss-Newton's method, which was for solving a least square problem. The second one is conjugate direction method, which is for solving a quadratic minimization problem. Uh, let me go to the top. So here we are trying to solve this quadratic minimization problem. So these are all very special class of problems. They appear a lot in across various areas, including statistics, computer science, machine learning, signal processing, controls, and so on. Um, and therefore, there are specialized algorithms developed for solving these problems because, you know, they um, they are much lower complexity and therefore can be embedded within devices uh, in embedded systems because you don't want to have complicated computation in embedded systems. So therefore, these methods are quite popular for specific applications. Uh, what I'm going to do in the next class is we'll talk about what is known as quasi-Newton's method.
And the idea in quasi-Newton's method is, I want to compute the second derivative inverse as k goes to infinity. So I want to recover the curvature information. Well, I shouldn't say as k goes to infinity, but you always want to be close to the second derivative inverse for k sufficiently large. Um, so you want to build the curvature information as you're proceeding into the algorithm. And how would you do that? Um, so let's think about it. So for gradient descent, I know the following. I know xk plus one, I know xk, I know gradient of fxk plus one, I know gradient of fxk. Okay, what does first order Taylor series say? So assuming that xk plus one and xk are close to each other, what would this, what would this derivative look like? So this is xk plus xk plus one minus xk. What would the first order Taylor series be for this? What do you guys think? What would the first order Taylor series be? I'm assuming, again, let me uh, reiterate, I'm assuming that xk plus one minus xk is small because you're taking small steps in gradient descent. No thoughts? No Okay, so gradient of f at x k plus Okay, so let me just write it. Second derivative of f at x k multiplied by x k plus one minus x k. Okay, so let me uh, move things around a little bit. So what I know is that the second derivative of f at xk multiplied by xk plus one minus xk should be approximately equal to the first derivative at xk plus one minus the first derivative at xk. Okay. So in other words, I want to find a positive definite matrix DK. Remember in Newton's method, DK should be second derivative of FXK inverse. So I want to find a positive definite matrix DK, which happens to satisfy this, uh, this condition. So I again want to reemphasize that I already know xk plus one, I already know xk, I already know the gradient of fxk plus one, and I already know gradient of fxk. And it just so happens that assuming that xk, xk plus one, and so on are close by, um, 
the second derivative of f at x k will be almost equal to the second derivative of f at x k plus one because th these are all continuous functions. And more importantly, the second derivative must satisfy this approximation. So in other words, x k plus one minus x k should be roughly equal to dk multiplied by the difference in the derivatives at successive points. And what the quasi-Newton method attempts to do is update dk using um, the gradient information. So this is what we are going to study in the next class. We are going to do the derivation for dk um, using certain update rules. And I'm going to introduce BFGS and DFP methods in the next class. So if you have any questions, you can stick around. Um, I'm ready to answer any questions or otherwise you can leave the Zoom link. I'll upload the lectures uh, after 15 or 20 minutes. Professor, I have one doubt. Yes. Uh, I find it, uh, like, I am not able to understand how we already know xk plus one. Isn't it that what we want to find? Like what is from xk, we want to go to xk plus one. How do we know, already know that? Well, so if you're running, so let's say, here is the idea. Let's say I start with dk equals to identity. So d, d1 equals to identity or d0 equals to identity. So, and I, I know x0 already. So I can run x1 equals to x0 minus alpha zero gradient of fx zero, right? Mm -hmm. And now I want to compute so after I have computed x1, I then compute gradient of fx1. Okay. Right? So now I know x0, gradient of fx0, I know x1 and I know gradient of fx1. Okay, so now- so Then I can update d1. I can get some value of d1 from d0 and something, something, you know, which is the update rule we will study in the next class. And then I can run the following iteration, x1 minus alpha one d1 gradient of fx1. Okay, so we started from d0, okay, that's what I that's was- That's right, that's right. So d0 could be identity, it could be some other positive definite matrix. Okay, uh, yeah. Okay. It makes sense now. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? I have a question from last, um, the last lecture. Oh, last lecture. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, when you were doing the example for rate of convergence with steepest descent. Right, right here. Um, yeah, I, did, I don't understand the step you got for alpha k equals two over m, big M plus lower M. Yes. Uh, so how do you get this inequality? Uh, how do you how do you even find that alpha k is equal to two over big M plus little m? So this is uh, uh, so it's a very long answer. Um, okay, so that wasn't part of the derivation. That yeah, was that's not of part of the derivation. So I'm just saying that if I pick alpha k in this fashion, then I can get this inequality. Okay. okay. Is the inequality also not part of the derivation? Well, you can derive it. It's de derived in the book. Uh, I'm just not deriving it in the class because of the time it's going to take to get to the derivation. But I can do it oh, right okay. now because right now we are not in the class time. So I can do it. Uh, uh, okay. So remember that I had mentioned that I minus alpha Q has, so, so let's say eigenvalues of Q are lambda one to lambda N, then I minus alpha Q has eigenvalues one minus alpha lambda one, 
one minus alpha lambda n. And let's say lambda one is, I'm going to put it in the decreasing, increasing order. So lambda one is the smallest eigenvalue, lambda n is the largest eigenvalue. Okay, so this holds, right? Mm -hmm. I can, let's say I pick alpha k equals to alpha equals to two over M plus capital M. What would my eigenvalues of I minus alpha Q look like? It will be one minus two lambda one over M plus capital M, one minus two over lambda N over M plus capital M. Um, is it, does everything make sense so far? Yeah. Right, and then I'll have the inequality in the reverse direction because I have negative lambda one here and so on. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so you know that lambda one is positive, right? And this two over M plus M is positive. So this term is going to be less than one right? And you know that mm -hmm. this term is going to be greater than negative one by a similar argument. So what you have is one less than one minus two lambda one over M plus capital M, one minus two lambda N over M plus capital M greater than minus one. And so your rho, which is the spectral radius of I minus alpha Q for two over M plus capital M is going to be the max of one minus two lambda one and one minus two lambda N. Any any questions so far? No. Okay, great. So you follow all the way until here. Now, in the case of gradient steepest descent there, xk plus one equals to xk minus alpha k qxk, which is i minus alpha qxk. And this iteration, will converse to zero if and only if rho of i minus alpha q is less than one. Okay, so let's assume that this particular, so we know already that this is actually less than one. So therefore this is actually going to converse, this iteration will converse to zero. And that's because I already know that the spectral radius is less than one. So once I know that xk will converge to x star and x star in this case is equal to zero, I now can compute Should I put square here or should I just put Yeah, let's just put square here. And this is the two norm that I'm talking about. So this would be x k transpose i minus alpha q square x k over x k transpose x k. And now we only need to argue that this is less than or equal to capital M minus small m over capital M plus m. Uh, do I need a square here? Let me just check, just give me a minute. No. Yeah, so I need to make sure that it is 
this should be square here. So is that easy to argue? Let me think about it. Uh, so I'm trying to think how to argue that this term, this term is less than equal to this term. Okay, so what I do know is the norm of AX square over norm of X square is less than equal to so assuming A is positive definite, this is less than equal to rho of A square. So this is a result I know from linear algebra. But so, so what, I, what I can show is that this term is actually less than equal to rho of I minus alpha Q square. Now I only need to argue that rho of I minus alpha Q is less than equal to M minus M over M plus M. Okay, so. So I have the expression of rho, my, rho of I minus alpha Q above. Is it easy to see that this is less than equal to M minus M over M plus M. Um, oh, actually, it may be. Um, all right. So, do you do you follow all the way until here? Do yeah, all I the way so. until here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now this is the only missing step right now. Um, so let's let's see a, let's see. So one minus two lambda one over m plus capital M. I know that lambda one is greater than or equal to m. So this is less than or equal to one minus two m over capital M plus m, which is equal to m minus m over m plus m. Okay. So I get one side. So I know that lambda n is greater than less than or equal to capital M. So this is greater than or equal to one minus two M over M plus M. So if I take the absolute value, this would be less than equal to, okay, so it seems like we got both the inequalities. Does this make sense? I'll let you. I'll let you copy it, and then you can think about. Yeah, I'm. I'm still kind of looking at it. How did you get uh, the M minus M term in the numerators? This one or this one? Uh, 
so this is equation number one this is equation number two this is equation number three so which one are you talking about in one one okay you have one oh, okay if you multiply the term the one term right there by m plus right. m that's over right m plus that's m. right okay yeah yeah oh, okay right i see it now yeah and the same thing happens in the second second equation as well except that this okay. numerator is now negative this is less than zero so when i take the absolute value the inequality will get reversed okay okay yeah i yeah. I, I see this now yeah yeah okay Great. perfect so so that's how you get the you get this expression okay that's okay. good so it, that's why yeah. it's just a tedious derivation but it can be done that's that's what i meant okay yeah i think i was just looking back at my notes and i thought i had missed the connection between how oh, no problem derived, you, you so. should just ask these questions that's why i'm here so I'm glad you asked this question because now this derivation is available online <laughs> ah. for others to see. I just didn't want to cover it during the class time uh, because it's just 20 minutes of linear algebra. Yeah, I understand. Okay, thanks. Perfect. Any other question? Uh, professor, uh, if you, I have a question in this today's lecture when you start Gauss-Newton method. Uh-huh. Uh, Newton uh, method. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah, there it is. So somewhere here you say, yeah, you say uh gradient of G of X will be positive semi definite for right. sure. Right. I right. did not right. understand how that is definitely yeah. positive semi yeah. semi definite. Yeah, okay, okay, good question. So let's say A is a matrix R N cross M then a a transpose is positive semi definite so so let's see why let's say i have i pick an x and rn and i know that a a transpose is a matrix in rn cross n and i know that a transpose is symmetric so this is a symmetric matrix so does all of this make sense to you? So A transpose is symmetric and A transpose is a square matrix in N cross N. Yes, yes. Okay. Now let's pick, a, let's pick a vector X and Rn. I have X transpose A, A transpose X, which is equal to A transpose X, two norm square, which is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so this means that A A transpose is positive semi-definite. Right, that's just by definition. Does that help you? Yeah, yeah, I'm clear. It's yeah. clear, Professor. Now, now I have a question for you. Okay, so now that you <clears throat> you've gone so far, when is A A transpose going to be positive definite? Any thoughts? So, so let's let's think about it this way. Under what condition would this be equal to zero, even when x is non-zero? <clears throat> so the question I'm asking is, when is a transpose positive definite, which is equivalent to asking when is a transpose x 
2 norm square equal to 0 if even if x is <clears throat> not equal to 0? If a isn't, um, if a is non sing if a is singular? If a is uh, less, ha yeah, if, <clears throat> if a has less rank. So if x is yeah. a null space of null a, space, yeah. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So if it is a if a transpose has a non-trivial null space, then a a transpose will be positive semi-definite. But if null space of a transpose is equal to null set, empty set, or actually it can't be empty set, but it just only has zero vector, then a a transpose is positive definite. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Professor. Sure. Any other question? There seems to be something in the chat window. Oh. All right. So no further questions. So I'll see you guys on Wednesday. And there is an office TA office hours on Wednesday, 9 a.m. So in case you have any questions, feel free to ask the TA or, or my office hours will be on Friday. So we can we could talk even on that day. Okay, so see you guys on Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks.